Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about asymmetry. When you think of the design concept of an asymmetrical aircraft, more than likely you think of this, the BV-141, easily the most iconic asymmetric plane ever made. Designed by Blom & Voss, a company we've looked at several times before, they are well known for their strange design choices around the time of the Second World War. Well, what if I told you that Blom & Voss made a plane even more asymmetrical? Imagine the 141, but much worse. A plane that looks like something in a video game glitched, this is the Blom & Voss P-111. The story of this monstrosity begins with the design of another strange Blom & Voss design, the BV-138. The 138 was built in response to a need for the Luftwaffe for a new long-range seaplane. For this need, Blom & Voss, and specifically Richard Vogt, submitted the 138 design, nicknamed the Flying Clog, as the main hull fuselage resembled a clog, the type of shoe. This design, effectively looking like somebody glued a boat hull, a wing, and a twin boom tail together, would be accepted by the Reich Ministry and officially introduced to the Luftwaffe in October 1940 where it would enjoy decent production numbers at around 300 strong and a pretty varied career, serving in such roles as long-range reconnaissance, troop transport, and mine sweeping. In Blom & Voss's effort to fulfill the long-range seaplane need and cover their bases, in a sense, a fallback design was needed in case the Reich Ministry didn't like the 138 design, or something went wrong in the production and testing of it. That fallback design was the 111. While I could not find any conclusive evidence for what the dimensions of the 111 would be, I think it's safe to assume that the 111 would be 19.85 meters long, 26.95 meters wide, and 5.9 meters tall. The reason I believe this is that the design of the 111 is effectively just a 138 design, with the parts shifted around. Look at the 111 design on the left and the 138 design on the right. As you can see, the wing appears to be the exact same shape, the hull sections appear to be exactly the same, and the tail of the 111 appears to be the same as one of the booms on the 138. The only major difference between the three major parts would be that the twin boom tail was changed to a single tail. Other than that, the pieces are all present. For the propulsion of the 111, there would be three engine compartments, just like the 138 had, but in a different configuration with better, more powerful engines. Instead of the 138's three Junkers UMO 205 engines, the 111 would house three upgraded versions of that engine, then referred to as the UMO 208. These engines, which did not exist outside of bench tests at this point, would ideally have nearly double the horsepower of the UMO 205. 1,500 horsepower compared to around 860. What effect this upgrade would have had on the potential top speed of the 111 is not definitively known. Some estimates put it around 186 miles an hour, but I do think it would have been more. The top speed of the 138 was around 177 miles an hour. So, if we assume that the total horsepower of the 111 is about double that of the 138, and probably around the same weight, factoring in any additional weight from the upgraded engines, and subtracted weight from the removal of one of the tail booms, it wouldn't surprise me if the 111's top speed was over 200 miles an hour, maybe around 210. It could only go so fast on account of what it was. As for its weaponry, the 111 would be outfitted with at least three guns, like the 138 was. On the nose of the main hull fuselage would be a single-man turret, 
outfitted with a 20mm MG151 cannon. On the rear of the hull section would be the other two guns in two separate turrets. One of them would be another 20mm cannon, and the other one would be a 13mm MG131 machine gun. Oddly enough, while this gun placement heavily favors the right side of the aircraft and would make hitting anything coming from the left rather difficult, I do think it is debatable that the gun placement was actually better than the 138, for the simple reason that there was potentially a better field of view with the rear guns on the 111. On the 138, you can see from the side profile that the two rear guns were kind of hidden by that twin boom tail. The lower gun would only really be able to fire in a very small cone, having to be careful of the horizontal tail plane and the twin boom tail. The upper gun would have more upward firing ability, but would still be limited towards the sides. On the other hand, for the 111, because the main hull fuselage was further separated from the tail section, and one half of the tail section was removed outright, the vision cone that would be protruding here would be significantly wider. If the guns rotated towards the right of the plane, the guns could be parallel to the wing. Rotating the other way towards the tail, the tail would still be in their field of view, but far less so than the 138. On both aircraft, the front turrets would basically be the same though, with the 111 just favoring the right side a little bit more. Now, apart from this hypothetical advantage the 111 had over the 138, were there any other potential benefits or detriments that the 111 design had? Right now, I can think of one potential benefit, other than the turret field of view, and two clear detriments. The benefit would be in saving some resources and maybe some production time. As previously stated, one of the tail booms was removed, so the resources needed to make that could be used elsewhere. In addition to that, because of the distance between the main hull fuselage and the tail section, one of the wing-mounted floats could be removed. More standard-looking flying boats would usually have a float on each wing and the main hull that help keep the aircraft stable and above water. With the 111's unique design, one of those floats could be removed, saving some resources there. Now, as the amount of time and resources saved from using the 111 design over the 138 minimal and probably not much of a factor, sure, but it is technically a benefit, so it is worth mentioning. But now, moving on to our first detriment, we have something that probably negates that benefit in the 111's weight distribution. The potential issue here is that if we divide the plane along the center line, on one side we have two engines and the tail. On the other, we have the hull and the third engine. The thing that concerns me is that the hull side would potentially be heavier than the other side, simply because of the sheer size of the hull. Perhaps the side with the two engines would be heavy enough, perhaps one engine is equivalent to the hull fuselage in weight, but I do have my doubts. In the scenario where one side is heavier than the other, they would probably want to add some additional weight to the other side, and in doing so would mean the usage of more resources. As for the other issue or detriment, my concern here is with the tail, and specifically the offset rudder. The only real frame of reference we have for a plane with such an offset singular rudder, to my knowledge, is the BV-141. Allegedly, that plane handled rather well, but even then, the 141 doesn't really compare to the 111, because the 141's tail, while being offset, was still pretty close to the center line. With something like the 111 and the tail being offset so severely, I question how that would have affected the plane's control. Would the plane rotate along the yaw axis to the left or right at equal rates and with similar control, 
or would one side be more favored than the other? Would it be able to rotate more sharply to the left and slower to the right, or vice versa? Or would somehow everything just balance out? As far as I can tell, no one has made a model version of the 111 or something similar with such an offset tail, so I truly do not know how this tail would have impacted the plane's control. Maybe somebody with more knowledge about aerodynamics may know how this controlled. But realistically though, unless some privately funded pet project happens, we'll probably never know definitively how something like the 111 at full scale would have flown. Blom and Voss today are quite well known for some strange designs, but the 111 really goes into the territory of absurdity. Part of me does wonder if Richard Vogt made the 111 design almost as a joke. He had quite the fascination with asymmetric designs, to be sure, but I do think this is the best explanation for the 111. Vogt was tasked with designing a new float plane or flying boat. For this, he made the 138 design. He liked the 138 design, but for one reason or another, he had a bit of a gut feeling that the German government wouldn't like it or would reject it, so in an effort to help sway their opinion towards it, he made the 111 design. Because the 111 was so ridiculous looking, so out there, and so unconventional in its design, it would make the government like the 138 more out of it being more practical and, well, sane. Now, is that wild speculation? Yes, but do I think it also makes the most sense? Probably. Alright, and with that, we'll go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Blom and Voss is just such a wealth of strange aircraft designs. For most of them, I do see what they were going for, what the idea was behind it, but the 111 is just something else. It's a monstrosity. A beautiful, beautiful monstrosity. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So. See ya.